Welcome to what is the first of, I hope, many events jointly sponsored by ISTS, the Institute for Security, Technology, and Society, and the Dickey Center. Uh, I'm V.S. Subramanian, the director of ISTS. And it's my very great pleasure and honor to introduce today uh, Samantha Ravitch, uh, who I've known for several years. Samantha is the head of the Transformative Cyber Innovation Lab at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy in Washington, DC. But this is just one of many very distinguished hats she currently wears and uh, has worn during her distinguished career. She served as Deputy National Security Advisor to former uh, Vice President Dick Cheney. She currently serves as Vice Chair of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board. She has, I think, seen a wide range of threats over the years, ranging from Al Qaeda, ISIS, and now increasingly cyber threats. So without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Samantha. Welcome. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you. It really is a pleasure to be here, and um, it's beautiful. I don't know if you noticed, the sun is shining, the, the campus looks magnificent. Um, uh, it's been raining way too much uh, down in DC, but so thank you very much for, for uh, getting this beautiful day for me. I really appreciate it. Um, before I, I, I start, just obviously want to make clear these are my personal comments from the research that I do at, uh, at the think tank that I'm associated with. They have nothing to do with, uh, with PIAB. Um, but I thought I would use uh, part of my time here today to, to talk about the research that my, my team and I have been conducting over the past few years on cyber-enabled economic warfare um, and some of our findings and where we are now putting our efforts, which get to the transformative uh, cyber innovation lab. And then I really do hope that we can have a, a robust discussion and, and Q&A, because I want to hear which parts of what I was talking about actually are, are interesting and, and may spur uh, other lines of, of research. Um, and also, let me add, although it is 4.35, so typically when they ask me to speak, they ask me to speak directly before cocktail hour. Um, uh, because uh, uh, typically the things that I work on, uh, CT, counterproliferation, uh, cyber threats, um, most people need a, need a drink uh, right after I finish. Um, I, I, I tend to leave uh, audiences in the past uh, despondent and, and hopeless. Um, you'll feel some of that, but I, I think where we're really trying to focus some of the research now is, is there a pathway towards hope? And is there things that can be done um, that if not uh, will completely eliminate the threat, it can happen? Um, what parts of it can we try to, to mitigate? Um, so so let, let me start. Um, since 2015, my team at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies and the Center for Sanctions and Illicit Finance and I have been engaged in researching, writing, and briefing on cyber-enabled economic warfare. Um, so what is that? What is cyber-enabled economic warfare? Uh, in brief, um, it refers to a hostile strategy involving attacks against a nation using cyber means. Um, those attacks focused on undermining key elements of an economy in order to weaken the country militarily and strategically or politically, right? So it is um, not just about stealing IP to give a country a market advantage or um, for criminals to steal money for whatever they want to use it, but it is particularly going after an economy in order to weaken that country strategically, militarily, politically. Um, and what we are doing is not only creating a taxonomy, uh, of these cyber-enabled economic warfare attacks to be used for academic purposes or theoretical purposes, but also given that we're in DC and we're at a think tank, um, we really have been working to create a way to explain what is going on to hopefully open the eyes of, of some folks in the government that may be able to do more about this and in the private sector. Um, so that they see what we are seeing, which is that um, there is potentially campaign plans underway in adversarial state and non-state actors, again, to weaken our economy in order to weaken us um, politically or strategically. 
You know, and at first, when we started this in, back in 2015, we really had a difficult time uh, getting some in the government and, and in the private sector to see behind the what they would see as ad hoc attacks uh, happening across our economy. And, and, and it was crazy because we even had trouble getting um, people in the banking sector, for instance, um, to understand this even after 2011 and 2013 uh, when J.P. Morgan, uh, Wells Fargo, American Express were all attacked by, now we know, uh, out in the open, um, a uh, hostile foreign actor. Even after the 2016 indictments of seven Iranian hackers tied back to the Iranian government for those attacks. Even after it became clear that the attacks upon our banking sector um, was not, as I said, to simply steal money, um, but most probably to lay the groundwork for getting into our banking system as payback for increased sanctions on Iranian financial entities. There seemed in some quarters to be an unwillingness to fully believe or, or understand that an adversary was embarking upon a strategic campaign plan to harm our private sector, uh, our ability to move money, to create value, to innovate. Right? There was a campaign plan to undermine those things with an ulterior motive, as I said, that goes well beyond the simple stealing of money. Um, you know, and, it, and it's a way, it's, it's hard, and it's ir ironic in some ways that we had such a, a difficult time breaking through um, to get people to understand that this could be happening. And I say it's ironic um, because our country uh, has been very good at it in the past. In fact, uh, soon after uh, we were born as a nation, we went after the economic wherewithal of Britain. Um, I, we went after the economic wherewithal of uh, Japan and Germany uh, during World War II, and, and uh, there is evidence to suggest that us going after the economic wherewithal of the Soviet Union um, was, is what led to a collapse. Um, and of course, more recently, uh, with our sanctions regimes, um, we have been going after North Korea and Iran. So the idea that others would um, think likewise, but with new tools, it, it seemed obvious to us, but not obvious to those that we were talking about. And, but again, since people in, in glass houses should definitely not throw stones, um, I didn't consider how an adversary could use economic warfare, let alone cyber-enabled economic warfare against us when I was in the White House um, helping to craft those economic sanctions against North Korea and Iran. And so we'd sit in, and Dan would know this well, we'd sit in the Situation Room and, and we'd be thinking about what can we do to constrain North Korea's nuclear weapons program, let's go after Bank of Delta Asia, how they move their money, or let's constrain Iran by kicking them out of SWIFT. Um, and we'd think about, we'd sit there and we'd think about, well, how could they harm us in response? North Korea, we'd think about they could, you know, set off another missile and uh, over time set off, test another nuclear weapon. With Iran, we would think they could go after our soldiers in Afghanistan or in Iraq. But we, I, maybe you guys were smarter, never contemplated how they, they Iran and North Korea in this instance, could go after our economy. It was ridiculous to even think that. North Korea has a GDP per capita of $1,300. What could they possibly do against the largest economy in the world? Well, back in 2006 and 2007, not really, nothing. Um, but uh, I think, and something I want to, you all to take away, is that golden age when we could take actions against other economies and not suffer likewise is coming to a close because the use of cyber has given nation states and some non-nation states the ability to punch far, far above their weight. So let me um, discuss a few of the more recent examples of we t what we term cyber-enabled economic warfare. I think one of the earliest attacks that really opened my eyes um, is what is now called dark soul. Uh, it happened in 2013 in South Korea, and the attacker was, no surprise, North Korea. Uh, and I think we can still learn a lot from this attack. We can learn lessons that, that we just need to learn and, and maybe aren't. Um, at the time of the attack, I was the co-chair 
of a congressionally mandated commission um, called the National Commission for the Review of Research and Development in the U.S. Intelligence Community. Um, so as Dark Soul is, is unwinding, it got me thinking to what do we have in our own arsenal to understand what's going on, uh, to defend and, and deter such an attack if it came at us. Anyway, in broad brushstrokes, in April of 2013, between 45,000 and 50,000 computers in South Korea's media and financial service sectors were rendered inoperable um, by North Korean malware. Across South Korea, um, people were trying to get money out of their ATMs for diapers, for food, uh, medicines, and they couldn't because their ATM screens were dark. Right? Um, they ch check their bank balances, nothing. They'd log on mobile devices, nothing. Uh, the dark soul attacks uh, cost an estimated $800 million to South Korean firms and citizens. Think about the panic and havoc right, that would ha be created here if our ATMs were shut down and we couldn't get our money. And then the media that we would turn to to tell us what the heck's going on was also dark and knocked out. So we wouldn't know what was going on, and we couldn't get our money. Um, the main purpose of the Dark Soul attacks appears not to be about the money, um, but rather to home Pyongyang's capability to undercut South Korea's ability to function in the midst of a northern offensive. Tellingly, Pyongyang uh, uh, launched its cyber strike in the midst of a major joint exercise um, between the United States and South Korea. Before I turn to attacks uh, on US entities, I want to briefly describe another cyber-enabled economic warfare attack, um, this time also against South Korea. Uh, but this time, the aggressor was not North Korea, but uh, China. Um, and I think it will give you an even richer flavor about how attacks on an economic targets are and can be used to shift a government's policies. Okay, so in the beginning of 2017, the South Korean company Latte Corporation, which employs over 60,000 people and owns businesses in everything from candy to construction to chemicals, agreed to sell to the South Korean government property to house a US anti-ballistic missile defense system to counter the North Korean missile threat. China has long opposed uh, the deployment of U.S. missile defense systems on the Korean Peninsula, citing national security concerns. Within days of the announcement of the sale, the website of one of Latte's prime units was taken down in a DDoS attack emanating from China. Simultaneously with the cyber attack, um, the Chinese government closed nearly half of Latte's 112 stores on mainland China, citing safety problems. Right. The Chinese state press blanketed uh, the media with editorials urging boycotts um, and said that Latte was an accomplice uh, in efforts to undermine China. Stock shares of the Latte corpora uh, shopping corporation fell as much as 7.8% as a result, resulting in $400 million of losses to shareholder value. Latte was forced to sell its Chinese-based assets at a fraction of what the company invested to construct them. I imagine that other large foreign companies operating in China, from that point on, will think twice about assisting their national governments against Beijing's wishes. So to recap, a private South Korean company sold land to their own government to use to help to protect their own citizens. And China punished the company through cyber and other means, costing the company tens, if not millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. Postscript, the, the missile defense system, the one, did go ahead, um, but it's surrounded by protesters, uh, night and day Korean protesters, and forcing US and Korean soldiers to be resupplied by helicopter. By, by China's standards, the strong arming of latte was child's play. I really think something that uh, could, they could do before breakfast. But let me underscore for you China's breadth and depth of their attacks across the Western economic landscape is breathtaking. I'll get back to that in a minute. But another cyber-enabled economic warfare attack conducted by a different state actor had more profound effects on the US homeland last year. In June of 2017, a computer virus, you're 
all familiar with, and I'm sure dubbed NotPetya, spread around the world, wipe data from computers of banks, energy firms, senior government officials, and an airport developed by Russia, uh, mostly focused on Ukraine, to get Ukraine to capitulate to Russian strategic demands, right? But the virus hopscotched uh, the globe, landed on a number of US-based and, and US companies. The shipping giant Maersk reported a total cost of dealing with the virus at between 200 and $300 million. FedEx reported spending roughly $400 million in remediation and related expenses. Pharmaceutical manufacturer Merck reported $670 million in losses when NotPetya temporarily disrupted the company's manufacturing, research, and sales uh, operations. Total worldwide losses are estimated to be $10 billion. Right? While NotPetya, it does not appear, was purposefully aimed to strike companies like Merck or Maersk or FedEx, aimed as it was at, at Ukraine, it has rung a bell on what a global cyber-enabled economic warfare attack could look like. One nation targeting the economic and critical infrastructure of an adversary to get them to change policies or even to destabilize that government, right? And it forces other nations to join the fray, either because an ally had been attacked or they were just unwitting uh, participants. <laughs> it just fell on them. So, I mean, in some ways, think about how this can really ramp up and think about this potentially as the modern day assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in another Eastern European country, triggering a series of events that led to World War I. So we at the Project on Cyber-Enabled Economic Warfare have not only been studying these attacks themselves, but analyzing what are the motives and the strategies behind these attacks by our most dangerous adversaries. What is the cyber-enabled economic warfare strategy of Moscow, Beijing, Pyongyang, Tehran? How are their decision-making and operational elements organized to undertake these attacks? What are the levels of resources they are putting to these capabilities? What is their escalatory ladder? And these are the types of questions we want to ask and help answer on cyber. And we focus on cyber-enabled economic warfare because we believe that the American economy is the greatest source of American strength. We are only the number one military in the world because we're the number one economy in the world. Right? And so undermine our economy and you undermine what makes America powerful. So what we are learning, North Korea employs its cyber capabilities to achieve a wide range of objectives, with South Korea being its prime but, but not its only target. South Korea suffers as many as 1.5 million attempted cyber intrusions from North Korea hackers every day. North Korea is a learning organization. Right? It observes best practices and incorporates them into its arsenal, which is, again, why I go back. I don't think we spend enough time in the US government, maybe in academia as well, focused on what's going on in South Korea. Because North Korea is resourceful. And just like they were able to build a world-class nuclear arsenal, even though their citizens eat tree bark, they are creating, have created a world-class cyber capability. Um, Iran's interest in cyber changed significantly after the discovery of Stuxnet. Um, Iran's cyber annual budget uh, prior to 2011 averaged three quarters of a billion dollars. Um, it's been growing by leaps and bounds uh, ever since. Um, Iran has conducted a number of very highly uh, specific and very highly high-profile cyber-enabled economic warfare attacks, um, the most famous being the two uh, Shamroon attacks against Saudi Arabia. Uh, you may have heard of them, but uh, again, a lot to learn from these attacks. The first, which destroyed data of 35,000 computers at Saudi Aramco in 2012, now, again, Saudi Aramco, the economic element that drives the power of Saudi Arabia. Right? You want to go after the kingdom? You want to go after the way they do policy? Go after their economic engine, Saudi Aramco. Um, now, the attack in 2012 led to every Aramco office anywhere in the world physically unplugging itself from the internet. It's, it's like unbelievable to even consider. And although oil production did remain steady, um, shipping, contracts, supply orders, everything that went over network systems or the internet was basically gone. 
Up until NotPetya, uh, Shamroon was probably the most destructive attack upon the private sector. And then there's Russia. As one of our researchers, um, Boris Zilverman, wrote in a new uh, monograph that we have published on the FDD website on Russian cyber-enabled economic warfare, Kaspersky Lab, um, the Russian antivirus company you might be familiar with, built by Eugene and Natalia Kaspersky, provides one of the best examples of how technical know-how, uh, market foresight, and government cooperation can produce not only a global tech giant, uh, but also a serious national security threat. The Kaspersky's were engineers um, for the KGB. Eugene even graduated from the technical faculty of the KGB higher school. Um, within a few years after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, both Eugene and Natalia joined the private sector, building an international antivirus software company, keeping their connections and relations with the Russian government. The same antivirus protocols that made Kaspersky antivirus a highly effective malware detector allowed Russian authorities to use the antivirus product to search and retrieve materials. How perfect. Right? How perfect. The Russian government helps build an IT company, markets itself all around the world, specifically also very highly focused in Washington and other parts around the United States. Um, they sell their software at a good price. It's good software to government, companies, private individuals around the world. It has the ability to phone home information about systems, vulnerabilities, individuals, your name. Um, it was a very good thing, although very long overdue, when the Department of Homeland Security in 2017 required all Kaspersky software to re be removed from government systems. China uh, poses a multi-vector threat um, to the United States regarding cyber. Every year, China intellectual property theft costs the U.S. economy over $300 billion, probably an understatement. Uh, most cyber incidents go unreported. Uh, many companies either do not know how or do not want to admit to the losses. Um, and of course, stealing proprietary technology and early stage ideas allows China to unfairly tap into the innovation of our free societies and weaken our businesses and our economy in the longer term. And China appears to understand very well um, that advantaging Chinese enterprises at the expense of the US degrades US national security. Senator Cornyn um, is absolutely right when he said that China is using a private sector investments to pill for American technology, that China has weaponized its investments in America in order to vacuum up in U.S. industrial capabilities from American companies. That goal, he added, is to turn our own technology and know-how against us in an effort to erase our national security advantage. So where do we go from here? Right. Well, our team continues to research, better understand the cyber-enabled economic warfare strategies of our adversaries, help ensure that both our government and our private sector are properly positioned to prevail on this battlefield. Because unlike earlier conflicts where American citizens and American businesses could look at the fight over there, surrounded by, as we were, two sides by water, um, in this battle space, American citizens and American companies are the, really the front lines in the fight. Um, so we agitate for better policies. Okay, now at this point you're going, where's the hopeful part? <laughs> I, 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 I know this is where I usually pause and, and I see people, you know, wondering when does it get hopeful. Um, and so we do agitate for better policies uh, to make real forward, better forward movement in protecting our economic base from hostile adversaries, user cyber means to undermine us. But we have to move faster. Because in this day and age um, of data and, and technological advances happening at the speed of light, we have to change the way we face those challenges. We have to be willing to rapidly prototype new tools and capabilities and refuse to fall into the trap that there has to be an answer to everything before we adopt it, right? And in this battle space, we have to move forward with the having the answers to some things. If we, we wait to find a unifying theory, we're gonna be dead in the water. Um, so to that point, we launched a, a nonprofit called the Transformative Cyber Innovation Lab, uh, funded through the generosity of a number of American philanthropies. 
And our mission is to help drive society-wide improvement in cyber resilience through the innovative synthesis of technology, policy, and governance. So these philanthropists came forward and they said, hey, love the work you're doing focused on what the adversary is and the strategy and all that good stuff, but can you make a difference you know, and, and try to close the gaps? We are not a technology company. We're small. We're in D.C. So what could be our value add? And we realized that our value add is, is this. Um, we understand, we can understand and are understanding where there are cyber gaps and vulnerabilities that exist both in the government and in the private sector for which there are existing technologies. Right? We're not a technology firm, we're not a vendor. Existing technologies that could help close some of those gaps and vulnerabilities. Second basket. But third basket, there are human elements that are preventing the transition of good technologies to, to help close the gaps of cyber vulnerabilities. Human elements like we don't understand that technology. We've never heard of that technology. We're afraid of liability if we try it. In the government, we don't have the authorities, Title 10, Title 50, all the different titles. We need legislation. We need new resources. Those are human elements. Those aren't the technological piece. Um, so that is where we spend our, our time. So I'll give you two very quick uh, examples of what we're doing, and then we can move on to discussion. Um, the first is... Uh, for those of you who have ever um, uh, taken a look at the defense supply chain, uh, it's terrifying, right? I mean, it is uh, uh, malware, malicious code, uh, counterfeit stuff um, has been inserted all over the defense supply chain. We think that distributed ledgers are very interesting um, to give some transparency to it, right? It's not a groundbreaking theory. Um, but oddly enough, there haven't been uh, very many, if all, any prototypes, real world use of distributed ledgers to buy things within defense acquisition. Why? Oh my God, you have to change defense acquisition. People are afraid to try it. All of the things that you always hear. So we got agreement from the Countering Terrorism Technical Support Office to prototype with us that we would use Microsoft blockchain and we would do the very simple, simple, almost a cartoon. The government office contracts a prime. The prime contracts with us. We write two lines of code. Hello world. Doesn't do anything. Put it on a blockchain. Have it go from the us to the prime to the government, back and forth. It's simple. People can see what it is. And we start to break down world. Oh, that's what you're talking about? Oh, that gives us insight. Oh, we can move things very quickly. We can pay contractors. They don't have to wait 180 days. Huh, that's interesting. Just showing that something can work in a safe environment, they don't have to eat the whole cow. They can just take a little bite and see that it works, has been able to move things in the massive bureaucracy of the Pentagon. Um, there, there are others, and, and we can get to other great uh, examples later, maybe during the the Q&A, but um, I just want to say that as our lab grows, we look forward to working on uh, more real-world problems and, and helping to solve them bit by bit with real-world solutions. Um, so, you know, again, it's a lot. It's a big, scary topic, um, but I think there is hope, and there are ways to secure, help secure our economic future, which is our national security future. Um, we have to be willing to move quickly and, as he has say, just, just do it. So um, thank you very much. Director of the Dickey Center, and now we will uh, do the part of our show that is, uh, you know, a little bit uh, Johnny Carson, a little bit uh, um, Dick Cavett. You can choose which one you want to be. <laughs> um, and, and we'll have a few questions uh, with Samantha. And I want to begin by thanking her for a terrific talk that, um, yes, yeah, scared the hell out of me again. But um, uh, and and then we'll we'll open it up to the crowd. Um, so, um, so many, um, so many issues. So the 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 mantra um, or the 
kind of as a mantra or the blanket excuse in the government for a long time, uh, going all the way back into the 90s, to date myself was. The problem with cyber was that all the important stuff was in the private sector, and the private sector um, was slow to come to the realization that they actually had responsibility in this area. And I was wondering if after all these big hacks, um, you think that is changing or do they, do the hacks have the opposite um, uh, effect and make uh, CEOs say, God damn it, I need a secure environment to work in. It's all your fault, government. Um, who can we point the finger at here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. So, I mean, there's a there's a few strands there. Um, first of all, I mean, companies are spending lots of money on cybersecurity, but they're angry because there is, at this point in time, but maybe smart people <laughs> will create it, there's no way to measure return on investment. For these, for these hundreds of millions of dollars that some companies are spending. And so they're doing it just so that, you know, the old joke, you know, if you're in the, in the woods and a bear is coming up, you don't have to run faster than the bear, you just have to run faster than your friend, right? And that's what's happening in terms of cybersecurity investment. They just want to say, like, well, we, you know, so that when they are, they are breached and when there's a massive exposure of their data, they can say, well, we spent the money, but it's not really about securing their data. It, it literally is just about running faster than their friend. So they are doing something, but they're not happy about it, which gets to, okay, well, okay, now what? What can they get happy about? And, you know, I speak to a lot of corporate boards, and, you know, oftentimes at the end of my remarks or during the q and I, I say, I honestly don't know why you guys aren't marching on Washington. I said, first of all, everyone marches on Washington. It's like a thing to do these days. I said, but you corporate leaders, it is not your responsibility to thwart an attack from a nation state. That is the responsibility of the US government to thwart an attack from a nation state. Um, so the, so I guess long-winded answer is, um, I, I actually lean towards um, the company side of this. Now, you know, granted, there's a lot they need to do and should be doing on cyber hygiene. And, you know, I mean, don't be stupid. Lock the doors. Do your patches. I mean, honestly. But when it comes to an attack by a nation state on our economic wherewithal, it's the responsibility of the U.S. government. It's why we pay taxes for, well, not in New Hampshire. You guys know. <laughs> They pay taxes. Well, People in New Hampshire. I know, they're so taxes. lucky. I they love that. Oh my taxes. God, it's so <laughs> excellent. But, um, if I can follow up and then I'll just uh, pass it off to uh, the yes. So I, I think that's a, a, a great answer because certainly in the early days, most people were concerned about cyber crime and not so much about the, the state attack. So, um, you know, the big, the big question mark here then is what role does cyber offense play in terms of cyber defense? I'm not on? Uh, I thought I was on. Um, so what role does um, cyber offense play in terms of cyber defense? And that, of course, is the purview of the government, at least so far. <laughs> yeah, so it is a very hot and heated debate, uh, you know, about this going on right now in Washington. There's been a couple, you know, the White House just released a cyber strategy. DOD just released a, a new cyber strategy. And um, the Hill in last year, or this most recent uh, NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, um, created a, a cyber solarium commission to also kind of think through these you know, these weighty issues. Um, but I'll tell you the, the big contours of, two of the contours of the debate, uh, some, some believe that you can deter in cyberspace. So you can deter a China or Russia, Iran, Pyongyang, not necessarily through cyber means deterring them, but yes, that is part of an arsenal, but you can deter them, you know, through lots of different ways using all elements of, of national power, punish them economically, you know, kick them out of organizations, whatever, but you can deter them. Um, there is another theory that I think is, uh, 
really taking hold in places like Cyber Command. Um, and that is called persistence. And the kind of the, the rules on persistence versus deterrence, deterrence suggests that we will deter an event from happening um, or an event from escalating. Persistence is, now we're already in the middle of it. Like the, the time for deterrence has long passed, like the, that, that horse is out of the barn. It's going on. We are in the middle of a cyber war. Um, and so for persistence, what it is now the game is where is the boundaries, right? So think about any war that's ever, you know, happened in history. Um, uh, you know, you're over there, I'm over here, you're incurring on my territory, I'm pushing you back and I'm incurring, in, you know, into your territory and we're trying to figure out where the border is. And eventually with you attacking me and me pushing you back and me you attacking, we, we figure out it's this cable is, is the boundary, right? Um, and, but we're not there in cyber yet, right? So the, the idea of persistence is we need to be actively engaged offensively, pushing you back, you're gonna incur, I'm gonna push you back until this border is established and then we can start to talk about norms. But we can't talk about norms until we actually have a reason to believe that this is the border. And that will happen through engaged offensive or as, what, what's the new term of war? Defend forward, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's an odd term. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I think you call it a euphemism. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, but if I can say one, one last point on, on the offensive side. is so when I talk about to these companies, there's always somebody at one of these big companies why can't we have a cyber stand your ground law? You know, like, you know, especially when I, when I talk about, I live in the South, when I, especially when I talk to companies in the South, someone comes into my house, or maybe New Hampshire too, I don't know. But, uh, you know, if I have a gun, they're going to feel it, right? <laughs> so why if they come into my company, can I, like, chase them out and chew them? I'm like, well, you can't actually even do that in, in a stand your ground scenario in any way. You can't chase them down to the next street. And, and shoot them. Um, but in the event that this starts to happen and companies start to try to take matters into their own hands, especially as it regards a nation state, I think that the US government better quickly start enforcing the Logan Act. Um, and, and that's that you know, private citizens and, and companies can't actually create and operationalize their own foreign policy. Um, that is a world. That is a world that is is not a good one um, for us. So uh, I would hope that uh, uh, that there would be swift action to kind of shut that down. Samantha, uh, I was not going to bring up cyber offense, but Dan but gave did. me a lead in. So let me follow up. So in standard military parlance, you know, we do intelligence preparation on the battlefield, the traditional battlefield which amongst other things includes imposing or insinuating intelligence assets onto the battlefield, pre-positioning assets to carry out operations. In the cyber setting, uh, we have um, reports, for example, in the Washington Post about a year back about uh, the Dutch intelligence agency, AIVD, penetrating the Russian operation that carried out the attack on the US election a couple of years back. Uh, I don't know if that report is true or not, but uh, if it is, they apparently, according to the report, were had compromised everything from the security cameras to the screens of the Russian operators carrying out the DNC hack. Um, and while I'm not from the south uh, of America, uh, I'm originally from the south of India, a different <laughs> place, with slightly different rules. Uh, it strikes me that having those kinds of assets in place is never a bad thing. And when a company such as a JP Morgan or someone else uh, is attacked in the sense that there's a low-grade attack carried out once, another low-grade attack carried out later, so that the collective set of attacks forms a consistent and substantial campaign, having those kinds of eyes on the ground would be really useful. And I sort of sympathize with some of the companies uh, which are the targets of this. So as a country, you know, how do you think we should think about policies around this that enable companies to at least detect 
where the attacks are coming back from without taking any further offensive action? Yeah, uh, or should yeah. this be handed over to the FBI? No, well, what, are the, what are the protocols? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, clearly on their own systems, they have a lot of flexibility and a lot of ability. And when they're, you know, worldwide international actors, you know, companies like, a, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase or, or others, um, in some ways, you know, they have they have better insight into into what's going on and and uh, data than than the U.S. government has. So there's there certainly is flexibility on that. It's when they hop off of you know chase chase someone past their networks mm -hmm. um, uh, that it really becomes a problem. Um, in terms of well, should they call the FBI? Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I'm not sure even the you know the latest series of uh, cyber um, uh, strategies uh, that have come out answer the question that you know when when Dan was in we didn't answer it when I was in we didn't answer it which is really the clear lines of who you're going to call um, and I, you know again when I advise companies I I, I say look. Get to know your field office, you know, for the FBI, because it probably is a call you want to make, um, and you certainly want to make a call to them before they make a call to you. Um, however, they're interested in solving crimes, right? So they're not the people most likely that are going to give you a heads up if something is headed your way. Um, they're the people that you call after it's, you know, it's broken into your house. Um, and uh, they're, they're not also going to be the people that help mitigate. Uh, so on the front hand, it's other intelligence agencies that you know, have, the, have the large caches of data to understand um, uh, what's coming at who. Um, on the back end, maybe DHS uh, to help with the mitigation. But that's a lot to ask of a, of a company. Right, uh, you know, I, I, again, I, I really do. My heart goes out to the private sector because, you know, first of all, government, U.S. government, tell me what is a good thing I'm supposed to use. You know, is it this vendor? Is it that vendor? You know, tell me, you know, why isn't it like a vaccine? I don't go and figure out which flu vaccine I'm supposed to get. I don't. I'm not an immunologist. I, I trust that the government has figured it out, and then I go get the flu vaccine. You know, and then uh, so you know, I don't know how companies are supposed to really be able to tell which one is is supposed to. But then after the fact, who who are you supposed to call? Well, you call the FBI for this. You call you know DHS for that. If you're one of the you know 16 largest banks in the country, then you have special permission through a entity called FSARC that works very closely with the intelligence community. But if you're you know, I don't know what your local bank is here, but if you're that local bank, you're not getting into that, you know, that sweet spot. So, um, I, you know, there's there's really not the 911 that you can call um, and then figures out for you as a citizen or an American company what to do. I don't know. I, I just feel frustrated. Isn't, isn't THS actually? The entity that's supposed to be issuing warnings uh, of they uh, issue general, they don't issue yeah. specific. Yeah, that's helpful. Right, <laughs> that's that's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, if we were having this conversation fifteen or uh, years ago, let's say, I think most people would be asking about the terrorist threat to mm. the internet, and I think. You know, the conventional wisdom right now is that terrorists, I think maybe it was the conventional wisdom five or six years ago, I'm, I hope it's still the conventional wisdom, that terrorists are, are that some groups are up for uh, vandalism uh, and sort of small scale uh, attacks, that the terrorist exploitation of the internet is most dangerous when it comes to recruitment and radicalization, uh, but the terrorists haven't shown any great capacities in this area. Do you still agree with that assessment? Yeah, I, I do. I do with this one caveat. So, so I do because defenses have gotten a lot better. And, you know, it's it's hard. It's not really easy to get into a, you know the grid. Although you know we kind of mock that it is. It isn't. Um, uh, so so clearly, certain nation states have have risen to the fore on this. So yes, in general, I I think you're right. Here's my concern. Because um, I always have to have a concern, but we're getting close to cocktail hour, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, is that as um, uh, 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 forensics and accountability um, uh, become ever better, which they are, 
um, that certain nation states may decide to have proxies, um, you know, give the proxy their capability, and then it's not really Iran, it's, it's Hezbollah, or it's, you know, some other, you know, somebody who, whatever can be that's, set up. That's true, but we're usually pretty good at getting to the proxies, too. I, I, th I, yeah. I think so, yeah. but, you know, I mean, it's it's just one concern. But I, I do see that that's, uh, I think that that's right, and hopefully it'll stay that way. Let me um, turn the conversation to some of the comments about Kaspersky Lab, because to me, the Kaspersky Lab scenario poses a much greater threat than what we've seen so far. So most of you who've installed any kind of software on your machine, whether it's your phone or whether it's your laptop or some other device that's connected, will see that your software is periodically reaching back to some server somewhere. It's not just the Kaspersky's of the world, but software developed in many, many countries around the world. So down the road, the if those companies are either based in countries that are hostile to the interests of the US, or if those countries, if those companies are controlled by or substantially influenced by entities in such hostile countries, then we run the risk that there will not be one Kaspersky lab or two, but potentially thousands. How should we think about this potential threat? I'm sorry, I know I plan to, Samantha said yes, she you try are, not to scare you. You are a buzz killer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not, I, I, I have to think about how, how we think about the broad category. Um, but, you know, on the specifics, we knew that Kaspersky was bad years before mm -hmm. we kicked them out of the government system or, you know, or, or told the American people. Uh, you know, and, and again, that's kind of unconscionable, right? Um, uh, you know, so, so even before we get to your question, which mm -hmm. is much more expansive, um, I, I think that, uh, uh, I don't, and I don't know whether the eyes have been opened. I mean, uh, what was I reading? You know, Canada is still embracing Huawei. <laughs> really? You know, um, that's, that's worrisome. Um, but there's, there's a number of, there's a, another, another company a little bit different called the Speech Technology Center, um, also grew out of KGB Acoustics. Um, they do things like uh, audio and, and uh, recording devices and lots of things on that front, have been working here in the U.S. for years with U.S. law enforcement, um, right? I mean, uh, interestingly enough, this is a company that's also had a lot of uh, uh, presence in Cuba, um, mm -hmm. which makes you wonder about people's, uh, the acoustic problems going on with our diplomats. But again, you know, I mean, it, 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 we, we in America it come from a basis that the private sector is private, right? And, you know, with, with there, yes, we regulate certain industries, but it's not baked into our DNA, um, you know, that the, the private sector is truly just an arm of the government. But in, you know, and, and so I think sometimes it's hard for us really to kind of take at, at first basis that a lot of these companies in, in hostile nations are set up by their governments, are owned by their governments, really don't have the freedom to make the decisions that our companies do. We should open it up. Yep. Questions? Great. Um, I'm just going to start right here if I could. So Can you wait for the, for the mic? Otherwise, your question will be lost to history. So a central focus of your speech was on attacks on private U.S. companies. I was just curious if you could speak a little bit to kind of the focus on maybe the infrastructure. What comes to the top of my mind is our energy networks, telecoms, communications, food, transportation. If you take these out, the scale is much greater in magnitude. Is it just that they're attacking private companies because there's an easier backdoor to get into? No, it's, it's both. I mean, we were just focused on, we were trying to focus on the broader swath of, you know, of the, of the American economy. Um, but uh, that is certainly not to say that those, you know, those other components um, aren't being held at risk. We see that they are. I mean, the, you know, the recent reports of, you know, what's going on on, on the, the grid, we've, we've, you know, it's in the open press. Um, 
really worrisome. Gets back to what I was saying, like we need to be learn. The American people need to be learning about what happened in Ukraine. Right, the grid went down there. It went dark in winter. Um, you know, there are a lot of hard questions that we have to ask ourselves, both in the uh, to protect, to protect. So, you know, what what should be done in terms of uh, making it harder for people to go after parts of of the grid? Um, and there are things, you know, from the transformative cyber innovation lab, we. We recruited the former chief engineer at uh, DISA, the, the, the guys that do all the defense uh, networks. And, um, you know, they're, our government is a, is a truly wonderful place. Um, they, you know, they have created um, ways to harden their systems um, and harden their, uh, you know, their own defense uh, own DOD owned energy grid because they do have some on their bases and, and other places. You know, they created uh, certain protocols that hardened them. Um, we pulsed other uh, agencies, specifically DOE, found they didn't know anything about them. They didn't know anything about these protocols that were tried and true and have actually been in place in DOD for the last decade. Right? So, I mean, from our little perch, um, we are now trying to open the aperture at DOE and saying, hey, just let us go talk to the grid you know, uh, operators about what we learned at DOD to help harden. And you, too, can take advantage of, of certain of these, these protocols. Um, but uh, it is, is not to say that uh, we don't have risk and we aren't. Um, being uh, held in harm's way in those other sectors. It's one of those great only in America stories, right? Uh, so first of all, thank you very much um, for everything you've said. I want to um, maybe offer a challenge or something that you said and hear your thoughts on it. Um, so, you, when you were talking about the relationship between the FBI and private companies, um, you mentioned that the FBI is really the entity that is um, interested in investigating crimes. So they're going to come after something terrible has happened, and they're not really going to be the entity warning you um, that something's on its way. Um, in the physical world, if the FBI were to get a bomb threat from, like, like have evidence that a nation state was planning a physical attack on a company, maybe I'm influenced too much by Hollywood, but my expectation would be that they would warn that company, right? That they actually would be, um, have that responsibility. Do you think the same does, should apply to cyber attacks? Yeah, potentially the, the you know, the, kind of flying the ointment on that is who would hold the data um, that would warn of an attack. Another you know, great thing about the US government is uh, uh, different agencies own different data, right? So uh, if it came from, uh, you know, from certain places and ways, the National Security Agency would own that data as to a risk on a certain place, a certain type of entity, um, most likely wouldn't be sharing it with the FBI. Uh, for lots of uh, reasons about how big and unwieldy the U.S. government is, um, but in in theory, yeah, I'm totally, uh, you know, uh, ag agree with, you know, agree with where you are. I mean, I, I look, I understand that there's always a tension between stopping a crime and stopping the network that operates behind the crime, right? There's always a tension. You know, if I know somebody's going to come after you, I want to warn you. But if I warn you, maybe I can't get, you know, the network that it was going to harm you and everybody else in this room. So there, that, there's a tension on that. You know, but again, again, I think that the U.S. government has to be um, pressed to do more to protect the private sector in, in this environment. And a great example of this, or a great kind of underscore of this. Um, uh, so... DHS is is there to protect dot gov, right? That they were given the mandate, thou shall protect the systems of dot gov. Uh, Cyber command was given the mandate, thou shall protect the systems of dot nil. Right? There is no authorizing legislation that dictates to an agency, thou shall protect dot com. So the U.S. government spends a lot of its efforts focused on itself. 
um, and not what really I think uh, is the basis and background of the power that ha is in the U.S. government stems from from the private sector and the citizens, not the other way. Yeah, I was oh. just about to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> Always first. <laughs> okay, more questions. Is that to you? Thank you. All right. Um, I'm interested in the tension that you describe in public opinion, right? You talk about how people are despondent and overwhelmed and at the same time reluctant to believe that, like, um, it's actually a thing, right? And I was wondering how this played into government response or under provision of security and, like, what, what efforts are there to, to educate or mobilize public and even in global public opinion? It seems like a lot of these attacks are inherently global with the way that the viruses go around. Yeah, so again, you know, so a couple different pieces on this. I mean, first of all, there's just the general, you know, knowledge of, you know, what is going on. So, uh, you know, and, and people's eyes have to be open so then they can take actions. There's the, you know, training for, for cyber hygiene, um, you know, because again, it's overwhelming. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of in this field and... You know, oftentimes I'm at a loss, you know, or we were talking, you know, I'm just about to, you know, go on a trip and it says, you know, download these patches. I'll get to it in a minute, right? You know, so um, it's, it's, it's too difficult. The, the advice and the guidance and the education, um, I think, as it stands now is, is too confusing. It's too complex. Um, but then the other piece, and you didn't really ask about this, but I, I do want to, to bring it up, um, is... Uh, what responsibility does or should the, the citizens have um, to hand over their data if it's going to help solve a problem that we all face, right? And that's a really tricky one. Um, I, you know, I, I, I can't say with certainty, and, and maybe VS can say with a lot more certainty, you know, if the U.S. government had a lot more of, of the citizens' data, would they be able to, you know, be much better at protecting um, the citizenry from these threats? I don't know the answer to that, right? So first of all, you need the answer, yes or no. If no, then forget it. You shouldn't get my data. If yes, what are the costs to it? Um, and, you know, those questions really do need to be answered and, and, and answered really thoughtfully, um, uh, because despite what you know, I had, I had said on the nation state threat and everything, this this vector of your question on what are the responsibilities of the of individual U.S. citizens if they are a data point in a bigger you know data pool that can help address some of these problems. Um, that's a you know, I don't know. That's a tough one. But I but I we may we may be forced to. We may be forced to face it. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. And I'm, gonna, I'm running a war game next month. And the scenario is there's some overseas event that occurs, a contingency, we're you know, potentially going to war against somebody or other, and a, a bunch of cyber-enabled economic warfare attacks spread across the, gov uh, across the country, across the economy. Right? A bank is taken down, a grid, a distribution, logistics. Can the US government force those companies to give over data? We need your data to be able to do the immediate forensics to know whether it was the enemy that we're about to go to war with has done these things, right? So I can argue it both ways. I can argue it from the U.S. government side. We're protecting the country. And I can argue it from the private company. Yeah, give me liability protection. Under what, uh, under what authority are you coming and grabbing my data, right? We haven't answered those. I, I don't think we've answered. We, the collective, have not answered those questions. And we, we kind of better... So, I mean, uh, I do want to in interject something there, mm. which is I certainly don't know the answer to your question, which is uh, what is the, you know, would the government do a better job at securing all of us if they had more access to our private data? It's not, the answer to that is not clear. But one thing has always struck me as a little odd, which is that a lot of us, perhaps many people in this room, but certainly a large number of people in America and the world over, put a ton of their data yeah. online. You know, if you have an Instagram account, a Facebook account, and you're posting stuff about your lives and, you know, who you had dinner with last night and where you are, what talk you're attending right now, uh, you're giving away a bunch of information about yourself. Many private corporations, our adversaries and others, 
can freely use this data to learn something about everybody in this room. But there are at least great sensitivities and in some cases some constraints that I'm aware of that prevent the US government from doing the same for US citizens. What's the thinking on this? Because, you know, we stand on the back of the U.S. Constitution that except for uh, powers that are explicitly given to the government, they reside with the people. I mean, you know, that, that is one of the things that makes us, you know, as strong as mm -hmm, we are. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not explicitly written in there that thou shall give all of your, <laughs> you know, data and have no privacy to any of it. Um, but it is weird because, uh, you know, Google can have it. Right. So it's not as if no one is having it, right? I, 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 you know, that, that's where the, the rub is. It's out there and others are collecting it. Mm. Just to respond, is it uh, the mic, please? Yeah. Uh, just in response, is it really relevant to bring up a 250-year-old document when talking about issues that have only existed for 30 years? Uh, data would not have even been a, a thought that would have ever come into the mind of the writers of the Constitution. Why are we not considering this problem in a new light? Well, I think we are, but we're, we're considering it within our core values. Right? We're considering it within the framework of you know, what our country is based on um, and individual rights and liberties are kind of at the forefront of that. Um, so while you can freely give your, you know, your stuff and, and Google can get it, which is a, a private entity, um, you know, entering into a world where the government can demand it, and oh, by the way, Google doesn't yet have up-armored vehicles with, you know, rocket, you know, <laughs> propelled grenade launchers. So, you know, the, you know, having the government have it um, raises a whole host of, of questions. They're not satisfactorily answered, and I think under times of duress or in crisis, um, I, I actually think the answer to my previous question would be there are certain emergency communications powers. Um, you know, the government can, can and has in the past taken over telecommunications, right? I mean, there's very explicit laws governing during wartime that they, there's the uh, Emergency Telecommunications Powers Act. They can take over. Remember the old, doo, doo, this is just a test, right? Some of you may know that that beeping sound. That is the US government taking over telecommunications to be able to put a message out to the American people in the event of a nuclear attack by the Soviets. It, that power still exists. So it exists in telecom, but it hasn't transferred to does it exist across data streams. Well, those questions need to be actually absolutely asked and answered. Uh, thank you for um, thank you for coming talk to us. Um, some as for someone working in a government sector, your talk is kind of eye opening to me. Um, my question is regarding North Korea. Mm. Um, as you pointed out, I also believe that North Korea is developing a top notch um, cyber capability, and it is known to build asymmetrical a asymmetrical capabilities to uh, offset. Um, it's inferiority in conventional military capabilities and also economic capability. And then cyber is especially um, clearly one of them um, on the military and also diplomatic front. And however, when we talk about um, cyber-enabled economic warfare um, centered on private sectors, um, what do you think their true motivation, mot uh, motivations and objectives given the nature of its regime and also uh, clear disadvantage in its economy and also like um, political status vis-a-vis -vis South Korea mm. or other countries. Mm. Uh, well, there's certainly like, I mean, on the just stealing of the money, uh, you know, the, the, the North Koreans have become very adept at, at busting sanctions, whether it's through crypto, uh, theft of crypto, um, or other ways to get it, you know, the, the Bangladesh bank heist. I mean, there's, there is clear evidence, and that wasn't a cyber-enabled economic warfare. That was robbing a bank. 
uh, you know, that uh, they're, they're under economic duress and they're looking for, you know, ways to, uh, you know, fill the coffers. Um, but, uh, you know, attacking Sony was not to create a North Korean movie industry, right? I mean, it, that's just, I, I, I would, def that would be weird. I just don't think that that's what it was. Um, uh, and and in, the, in the strange world of the, the Kim family regime, you know, in some ways it, it, I don't usually bring it up because sometimes it, it elicits laughter, but think about it. Sony Corporation, American Corporation, based in California, releases a movie. Um, the Kim family doesn't like it. You know, goes after a private American corporation, and you know, and costs tens of millions of dollars to its bottom line, forcing it to pull the movie. Right? I mean, again, it's kind of a silly-ish example, and I say ish because it's a movie. Who cares? Whatever. And I didn't actually see it. I didn't actually see it. I hear it's not no, even a funny. great movie. It's funny. Is it funny? Yeah, that's what's funny. Really? Is it as funny as, <laughs> is it as good as Team America? <laughs> Team America's awesome. I, I spent more time in uh, the emails <laughs> than the exams, actually. <laughs> 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 and, and, okay, so I, I always keep meaning I need to see it. But, you know, and I say, you know, silly-ish, because, again, it was, you know, it was a company. They changed the policy of, of that company, right? So extrapolate that up. Um, and so it's it's both. But it took us three to Can five you? years to harden it to be Sony. Sony. That's the lesson that, in my mind, as an old IT guy, that companies have to learn fast. I work for a big bank. I work for a big bank in in, uh, in international trade finance, and we spent a lot of money hardening the security. But that's what I I think. Private industry has got to defend the assets that they're responsible for, and I think the federal government has got to do something offensively. The guy talked about what the Dutch did; they absolutely did that. That's a confirmed report, and I think we ought to be doing that as well. But last, Samuel Johnson said, "If all objections must be first overcome, then nothing will be mm -hmm. accomplished." Mm -hmm. <laughs> More of an observation than a question, but a follow-up from that. Um, you had said early on that you didn't, you thought corporations didn't know how to calculate an ROI mm. on cybersecurity defense spending, and I actually don't agree with that. So what they calculate is an ROI on their overall IT infrastructure spend. So their IT infrastructure spend enables their business, enables new products and services, enables worker productivity, employee productivity, all those things they measure. And we're in an environment we're in an environment over the last 15 or 20 years, the cost of compute and the cost of telecommunications has gone down exponentially. So, but they haven't made a leap. The savings they thought they would do was the cost of defense, the security costs is rising. It's a cost of their IT infrastructure. It's a cost of providing the services they provide. And so that's the way they look at it. They don't look at a return on investment on just defense, they look at a return on investment on it's cost of doing business. It's cost of doing business they'd rather not have. They'd rather not have, um, but they're forced to have it. And they have to build their own capability. And I don't think they would rely on the government because they don't think the best, they don't think the best talent is in the government. Because the government's best talent in this area is in the military, right? And intelligence. It's not, you know, it's not going to be deployed protecting corporations. So they are responsible for their own defenses. And they've got to find the best talent. Right. Yeah, it turns out that the government also knows it doesn't have the greatest talent in these areas as well. So there's a venture fund called Incutel, which is funded, you know them, it's funded by a bunch of security agencies. It started with the CIA, a bunch of other security agencies. And they're trying to fund startups with the best talent to keep developing this technology because they're not going to develop the best talent. So. Yeah, I, I just think for the majority of, of companies who aren't the biggest ones, right? They're the small, medium-sized enterprise. 
and but those aren't going to cause the economic disruption. Oh, uh, you are. get a whole bunch of them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, I, I, where I think is a really interesting conversation taking place is the insurance industry, and how this how this lashes on to changing behavior and having the insurance industry, which are really really at the forefront of of trying to figure out, you know, actuarially how how to price this. Um, and we, we've been having a, a number of really kind of, I, I think, very cool conversations about what they're doing and then how, how does it change behavior and what kind of behavior do you want it to, to change. Right. So um, I think that's also a very promising path. Right. And then to this question here on the FBI and warning people, the reality is a government agency could only warn a corporation of an attack if they had access to their systems. And no corporation is going to give the government access to their systems. Because that's the only way to detect the attack is to be in the systems, right? So they can help forensically, you know, uh, deconstruct the attack ex post. Right. Um, or if another or, agency right? found that there is going Or a similar to attack pattern or whatever. Yeah, but, right. but no corporations can give the government access to their systems to be a defense shield or a warning system. So I think something that got a lot of coverage over the summer in the media was the white paper granting Theresa May more power in terms of rejecting transactions between UK companies and foreign companies, especially that had a national security nexus. Um, something I'm curious about is more recently, at least in the United States at least, President Trump said that even if the Broadcom and Qualcomm transaction were to close, it would not pass regulatory approval under his watch. And so my question is more so, do you think that is a trend, A, that predates President Trump's presidency, um, and B, is something that will stay within this administration, or is it going to really continue moving forward? So you're talking about, like, CFIUS and, and other, you know, other, other uh, uh, regulations. So they just strengthened CFIUS as the Committee for uh, Foreign Investment in the United States. Um, and where a national security interest um, uh, it comes to play, uh, the purchase of a, a company, an American company, by a foreign company can be can be stopped. Um, uh, no, it, it's gotten much more robust. Um, it's bipartisan legislation signed by the president. Firma it was called. Um, it absolutely strengthened uh, the the types of transactions that can be reviewed. There's a ton more money going into the agencies that are reviewing. The transactions, um, but it doesn't catch everything. Um, and uh, so, another piece of our work, we became very concerned about um, uh, sensitive technology leaking out, and on cyber specifically, cyber technology uh, leaking out of the uh, country through bankruptcy courts. So, CFIUS does not cover uh, bankruptcy. Um, oddly enough. And uh, there's not a lot of focus on what happens in administrative or bankruptcy courts. Um, and so we have been uh, gathering data on this problem. Um, we have been working with a small set of judges on uh, how would you train judges um, to, to know whether there's a, a, a company going bankrupt that has sensitive technology, who would they call if you know, they found it out so that a hostile nation doesn't walk into a courtroom and buy a company with sensitive technology. Um, and uh, uh, using existing technology, in fact, we might run some Kaggle type uh, competition. Um, uh, there are data sets that exist in the US government, ITAR, EAR, dance familiar with these things, um, that been at least some companies, doesn't it's not the whole range, but uh, certain American companies that have sensitive technology, uh, you could easily have a system that does a match between those and Westlaw or some other database when a company is going bankrupt. And if it pings, um, you know you need to look closer at it. Um, so uh, a, again, a, a small gap that we didn't have to think about in the past. But answer to your question, direct answer to your question, it's not, it's not something that either started with this administration, um, and it's certainly not going to end with this administration. It's a, it's a trend that is absolutely going to continue. And so your exact words were that China has weaponized investments in America. And Those were its inner corners, actually. Okay. Um, it's a good line. Uh, and so something that I'm curious about is, you know, with 
the VC arm in InQtel for the IC and a number of patriots in the private sector that assist the United States government. Is the role of cooperation with these companies more so on the defensive front or is it on the offensive front as well? I think, I mean, building capabilities, you know, and how they're used um, could be either defensive or offensive. And, and uh, you know, VS would know better than I, you know, a lot of these capabilities are, are fungible. But I want to just broaden out a little bit out of your question <clears throat> because it's not all foreign companies, right? It's, you know, and, and this is something that I think is, is really important to focus on. As we think about this threat to the Western economic um, uh, system, we have to find ways to work uh, closely with friends and allies and their economies and their companies um, you know, to be able to have a bulwark on this. Um, and uh, I think we might be getting there. So a British company coming to buy you know, a US company, depending on who owns that British company, is going to get a, certain, a different type of scrutiny. In fact, a British company can actually apply to have uh, you know, security clearances and, and create something called a proxy board, whatever, to actually do work, classified work. Uh, so there's, there's different, different uh, levels of it. <coughs> Did I get that right? Pretty much. You know more than I do. I don't know. You're a state. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You're my <laughs> Thank you for your speech. Uh, I have a question here that we just know that the United States are suffering tons of cyber attacks every minute. Uh, most of them are the national-based cyber attacks from the big countries, just like just like the Russia, China, or North Korea. I would like to know that whether there are some kind of analysis reports showing that those countries are targeting at some specific parts in common or different countries mm. have their own different interests on the cyber attacks. Yeah, no, I mean, that's great. That's a great question. I, I, uh, nothing comes to mind that overlays, but I think there, I think there is. Um, but, uh, I mean, clearly there's a, there's a number of reports that look at you know, forensically, how, how can you tell code is from one country and not another? But, you know, when you overlap their attack vectors, um, you know, even though you wouldn't be able to say with causality that they're working together, um, I don't know. It's a cool question. I don't know. I'd like to know. So if you find out, let me know. <laughs> Oh, let's see if I can remember my question now. Um, something that we talk about in lab is um, uh, quite often is this um, notion that you can't wait until you have a perfect system. You've had to just mm. be deploying things as you have them. And that um, one of the heuristics that we come up with, or, or um, I don't know what the word is, but basically you want to simultaneously be rising the cost of performing an attack while lowering the benefit you get from doing that attack. Um, and that, that trade-off will help you um, effectively just move the target somewhere else, but you do this domino effect and mm -hmm. you make everything more secure. Are there other paradigms that you end up talking about in your work? Um, well, persistence was one of them. Okay. Right? So, yeah. so persistence is uh, while you're doing that, but uh, you know, forcibly keep forcing them back. Um, uh, yes, but I can't think of one at the moment. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, so we'll take this one last question and then let everyone go home. All right, so uh, to, to bring it back to uh, what I asked about earlier, um, since it is known that our government has been collecting data on U.S. citizens as revealed in the Snowden Papers, uh, this is already an issue that we need to deal with. Um, you know, they, big companies have been working with the government to allow them to collect data on U.S. citizens, such as Verizon and the metadata scandal, and this is something that should be talked about. So what are we doing currently to help protect U.S. citizens and prevent these shady parts of the government, like the NSA, who use classification as a way to hide their techniques? Uh, what are we doing to increase transparency, I guess. Uh, 
you know, I take issue with a, a numerous <laughs> parts, um, uh, you know, of, uh, I mean, Snowden was, you know, not a patriot. Uh, he was not doing it for anything other than either himself and or um, hostile foreign intelligence services. So, you know, start there and kind of finish there when you come to talk about Snowden. Um, uh, you know, like, I, I think that where I do agree with what you had said in your last question about, you know, are, are we properly positioned given today's set of realities, right? What the government should be collecting, I mean, data and how central it is, you know, not just to my privacy, but for me to be an educated, you know, person connected to the world that can feed myself and my family, right? It's almost a basic need that needs to be filled now. Um, you know, what role the government shouldn't have in that, um, again, we're, we're right at the beginning of really addressing those. So the laws, the laws as they exist, um, many of them, I, I would suspect, are outdated. I mean, it's not too different than some of the hard things we had to face, you know, after 9-11. Uh, in terms of what should we be collecting, you know, and what should we make people have to suffer with in the airports? What, you know, what should we be able to do in, in furtherance of, you know, a counterterrorism strategy that protects, you know, the United States from hostile forces? We had to work our way through it. Um, you know, th there's not malintent on the part of these government agencies. It's struggling with how do you reconcile you know the new reality to to some of these old laws, especially, and I can't I can't stress this enough, especially because everyone is giving it away to everyone you know already, and Google's collecting it all. So it is you know I talk to these folks inside the government, you know, who are incredibly frustrated um, because they can't even use the stuff to figure out do they want to hire somebody. They can't go and look at their their public social media profile. <laughs> right? <Great. laughs> they can't. In most agencies, they can't. And yet it's out there. Um, so yeah, so, so there's a, a disconnect. Transparency, maybe it's transparency, but I, I think it's, it's a public conversation that the American public has to decide how do they rank privacy and security. And then the government should follow suit based on what the American people decide for themselves, not the other way around. Well, I think with that, We'll bring the session to a close. Thank Samantha, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Oh, thanks. For this.